just another couple minutes and we'll get started. I'm getting things live streaming. For those of you here. Go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Okay, my watch says one, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, for just a couple notes for those of you who are tuning in, first time maybe, um, if you ever have an issue hearing me or a video isn't, you can't hear it or it's not playing on your end, or you have a question along the way, please put it into the chat. Um, that I have the chat window open so I can see your questions come through. Um, there's also a Q&A section, but it's actually easier for me to just see it in the chat if you can go ahead and do that. Um, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So thank you to everybody who's tuning in. Um, my name is Emily Davenport and I work for the University of Georgia in the Marine Science Department for a group called EcoGig. Um, we were funded and we do research in the Gulf of Mexico after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that happened in 2010. And today is actually the 10 year anniversary of the start of that spill. Um, and I do have a treat for you guys today. Our director, Dr. Mandy Joy is joining in today. So she's the expert on all things um, oil and Gulf of Mexico. So if you guys have questions for her, she's listening right in right now, I believe. She can go ahead and say hi. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. All right, so I'm gonna, Go ahead and get started and Mandy may jump in if I um, forget anything or um, um, misspeaking. But anyway, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about oil in the ocean. Um, in particular, I'm gonna kind of focus my efforts here on the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it's one of the most active places in the world for natural oil and gas seeps. So, and of course we have researchers who work in the Gulf. So that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. <clears throat> um, so this is a picture of um, an oil seep, a naturally occurring oil seep that is in the Gulf um, and Oil and gas just naturally bubble out of the sea floor from big reserves underneath the sediment. And that's why we drill for oil in the ocean. Um, and the Gulf in particular, we have a lot of oil wells and rigs in the Gulf drilling all the time because there is a lot of oil to be had in that area. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of how small an oil seep might be. There's um, a large reserve of oil underneath the seafloor, but usually the seeps are pretty little. Um, they bubble out just a little bit of oil. There's a lot of them in the Gulf of Mexico, but um, they're just bubbling out a little bit of oil at a time. 
Um, here's a little video I will show of an oil seep. This is a pretty active oil seep that is bubbling away. Um, so again, not not a not a lot of oil when you compare it to something like an oil spill. There are just a lot of seeps that exist in the Gulf. So there's a lot of <clears throat> oil naturally bubbling out, but um, you can see there there is life down there and there's a lot of life that's adapted to live in, um, in a condition where there's oil coming out of the seafloor. They actually depend on that to live. So you can kind of see the oil bubbles. I'm gonna go ahead and stop this one and I'll move on to another. Oh, nope. Oh, okay. So this is another video. This is more of an up close of some oil bubbling up. You can see um, these pink things right here are actually worms. There's a shrimp down at the bottom. So you see there's a lot of life that's happening right around the oil. Um, these worms I think are maybe an inch to two inches long. So that gives you kind of an idea of scale, how big everything is happening here. And so these are um, probably oil coated bubbles of methane gas bubbling out. Oops. Um, okay, and then this is uh, just a brief rundown of cold seeps in the Gulf. This is by um, Nautilus Live or otherwise Ocean Exploration Trust and EcoGig um, has done a lot of work in the Gulf with them. They have a, a nice um, archive of EcoGig related research on their website. If you ever want to check them out, they're nautiluslive.org. <laughs> The Nautilus will be visiting some brine seeps in the Gulf of Mexico. A brine pool is formed when there's a salt deposit that's pretty close to the surface of the seafloor and it's interacting with water that when the sediment overlying it is compressed, the fluids seep out and form this dense lake-like or sometimes river-like deposit. The scientists are interested in studying the muscle communities that live in this inhospitable, low oxygen environment. So scientists are going to sample the mussels, also look at the bacteria and figure out uh, why they're able to live in this area. Some of the bacteria live off the methane that's coming out of the brine seeps and some are making a living off of the hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide. Um, they sometimes also host tube worm communities and also some outcrops of methane hydrate deposits. So they can be very visually stunning to look at. Okay, so brine pools, like she mentioned in the video, um, often occur around in the same area as um, cold seeps. There's often methane that is bubbling out of the brine itself. And then you have these communities that are adapted to living in these environments. And they um, rely on a process called chemosynthesis to get their energy. So there's actually bacteria that are taking those chemicals and like the methane the hydrogen sulfide, that kind of stuff coming out of the seafloor um, and turning it into food for the organisms to eat. And a lot of them have those bacteria inside their bodies and it helps them turn um, the chemicals into food and, and they kind of like having a little kitchen inside their body. Um, and uh, so you'll see these, the brine pools and then you'll see these other really you know interesting organisms that live down there so here is for example is a picture of some chemosynthetic bacteria the white fuzzy stuff on the animals um, which there's bacteria that grows in mats um, and then there's actually bacteria that can be inside the animal as well and so then there's these two worms right here and then you have um, mussels and you could see in the video, the muscles that they pulled up, they're actually very large, um, not like the muscle that you would eat uh, at your din on your dinner plate. Uh, these ones are the same size as your dinner plate. Um, and if you want to know a little more about chemosynthesis, I actually did a webinar about, about that um, topic a few weeks ago. 
and it's um, on our YouTube page, or if you go to ecogig.org, our website, you can find it um, linked out there as well. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that, I have a whole webinar about it. Um, so here are some tube worms. These are cold seep tube worms. There are lots of different kinds of tube worms, um, ones that live near hydrothermal vents. Um, and these one, these guys live near cold seeps. They have bacteria inside their bodies. They actually don't have a mouth at all. This looks like it might be a mouth right here, but this is their plume. Um, there's no mouth opening. They have the ability to take chemicals from the water um, and pull it into their body through their plume. And actually they also have a root system that anchors them into the sediment and they pull chemicals out of the sediment as well um, to feed those bacteria inside their bodies. And so these guys are living and thriving near methane gas and oil. And then corals um, actually live in these environments as well, not, not right next to a seep, but um, uh, they come in after a seep has kind of gone away. Um, the bacteria that are associated with a, a cold seep as they work to break down that oil and gas, they actually deposit do, um, carbonate, which is like a hard substance onto the seafloor. And the corals are dependent upon that substance to kind of anchor themselves too. So you'll see deep sea coral communities kind of come in after a seep has been done, is done bubbling. Um, and a, about 50% of our coral reefs are actually in the deep sea. Um, and so this is just one example of a coral reef in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, they're all sorts of beautiful colors and they live, they grow very slowly and they live for hundreds of years because they grow so slow, but they are an animal. And you can see they're kind of home to other animals like these sea stars that wrap themselves up in the coral and anemones and all sorts of other things live on them and kind of depend on them as a habitat. Um, so they are living not directly in the oil, but, but they depend on those, that oil um, to live, um, to provide their habitat. Uh, okay, so you know we have these beautiful habitats down in the deep sea, down in the Gulf of Mexico, but there's also these large oil reserves under the seafloor and we're tapping into them and drilling for oil because we rely on oil for everyday activities to drive our cars, to heat our, heat our houses, provide light, um, to, you know, all, all of that. So in some way, uh, plastic water bottles come from oil, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of risks associated with oil drilling, um, leaks, spills, accidents, such as the Deepwater Horizon that happened in 2010. Uh, there's also pollution associated with oil drilling. Um, they do frack uh, deep sea uh, wells as, just like they do fracking on land. And they're, the chemicals have to go somewhere and they sometimes aren't stored properly. They're just dumped. Um, and then there's also seismic testing that's associated with oil exploration, which can harm and kill wildlife. Uh, so just to show you, I showed this, um, I talked, I did a webinar last week about sound in the ocean um, and talked a little bit about this. I'll show again that uh, this is a seismic air gun. It's towed behind um, a vessel. This is the first thing they do when they're looking for oil and gas in the ocean is they're blasting these air guns and the sound bounces off the seafloor and gives them an idea of where those oil and gas deposits might be, but that's, they're very loud um, and they're, you know, animals that rely on sound in the ocean. Uh, this can be really disruptive to them. They, when they're looking for oil, they're towing lots of these air guns behind the ships and they're blasting them repeatedly over and over and over again to try and get an idea of where those oil and gas deposits are. Um, here's a, this video is a little outdated. I think it was made about five years ago, but this just gives a little more information. In April of 2010, the world watched an environmental catastrophe unfold in the Gulf of Mexico. The Deepwater Horizon oil spill gushed for three long months, leaving 11 workers dead and more than 200 million gallons of oil spilled into the Gulf. 
Instead of learning from this disaster, President Obama is now considering taking the first steps to bring this dirty and dangerous drilling to the Atlantic Ocean. Seismic air gun testing is now being considered for an area twice the size of California, spanning from Delaware to Florida, as a first step in the search for oil and gas deposits deep below the ocean floor. This area has been protected from drilling for more than 30 years. The government itself estimates that seismic air gun testing would injure more than 138,000 dolphins and whales, including the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. There are only about 500 North Atlantic right whales left in the world. Air guns would also harm sea turtles, as well as commercially valuable fish, which many people depend on for their livelihoods. During this process, a vessel tows a seismic air gun through the water. While the air gun shoots extremely loud blasts of compressed air to the ocean bottom and deep beneath the sea floor, and they're repeated every 10 seconds, 24 hours a day, for days to weeks on end. The blasts are so loud and constant that they can disturb the vital behaviors of fish, dolphins, whales, and sea turtles, causing temporary or permanent hearing loss. But for these animals, deafness can lead to death. The noise can cause them to abandon their homes, and it can disrupt feeding, mating, and other vital activities. But seismic testing is not necessary. It will lead to more offshore drilling, more risk of disasters, and more dependence on fossil fuels, when we could instead be developing clean energy sources. We don't have to turn the Atlantic Ocean into a blast zone. With your help, we can stop seismic air gun testing. Please join Oceana and tell President Obama to stop seismic air gun testing today. Okay, well, obviously, President Obama isn't in office anymore, but um, this just kind of gives you a good idea of, of the damage that seismic air gun testing is doing, and also that we they were looking into drilling in the Atlantic. This is still kind of an ongoing thing. Um, oops. Um, sorry, technical difficulties there. Uh, anyway, um, so that, you know, it's still ongoing, the drilling in the Atlantic. It's, uh, to date right now, there aren't any active wells in the Atlantic, but it's always a possibility. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but as I said already, 2010, the Deepwater Horizon accident happened um, and resulted in basically the world's largest marine oil spill. Um, 11 men lost their lives. Uh, today was the beginning of that accident. Um, it actually happened around 9.45, 10 o'clock tonight. Um, and that spill, um, the, the, the well that that rig was tapping into, they were not able to cap that well um, until July 15th of 2010. So 87 days later, they finally stopped that well from gushing oil. Um, there was so much oil in the Gulf, in, um, in the water that you could actually see it from space. So this was an image taken on May 24th, all of this white kind of gray swirly is all the oil. And this is off of Louisiana right up here. Um, and so you could see the oil from space. Um, it was estimated that 4.9 million barrels of oil was spilled into the Gulf, which is 210 million gallons. Um, if you took those barrels of oil and lined them up, they would stretch from Atlanta, Georgia to Los Angeles, California, if you line them uh, side by side. So it's quite a lot of oil. It's hard to imagine exactly how much oil that is, but it was a lot. Uh, this is just a few images for you of the oil on the water. Um, you can see this brown is all the oil. It's just a tiny amount of, of the oil that was spilled, but it coated everything, the bottoms of boats. It got into the marsh. All of this brown is oil in the marshes. Um, 
a lot of it washed up on the beaches. This is our tar balls um, in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Uh, a lot of animals were coated in oil as well. This bird, um, pelicans, anything that really couldn't get out of the way fast enough was um, impacted. You can see these are a bunch of dolphins swimming through all of this orangish brown is oil on the surface. And they obviously couldn't see it, so they swam through it. There's a lot of impact on the um, marine life in the Gulf. Okay, like I've said before, today is the 10 year anniversary. We're actually um, doing a big social media push this week. So if you wanna um, read some perspectives from um, Dr. Joy, as well as our re other researchers that work for EcoGig, um, we're doing a big uh, share online this week. So follow along, uh, it's under the hashtag Deepwater Diaries. And it's, uh, we're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and they'll be sharing on there, as well as our website, ecogig.org. So you can read more about that, read some perspectives of people that were there right at the beginning um, and the end of the spill and what they've been doing since and how the spill um, influenced their research today. It's pretty, pretty good stuff. Um, okay, so the, the video that I showed you does talk about oil drilling in the Atlantic. Um, currently, there are no active oil and gas wells, but you can see that every five years, the federal government has to reevaluate the potential. And um, in 2017, our current administration decided to open up more areas to drilling. Um, but there was a, a big pushback. You saw the Oceana video even um, when Obama was in office. There was a big pushback to no more drilling. Um, there's actually been a lot of research to inform exploration in that area as well, um, oil exploration, because we still don't know a lot about um, the habitats that exist there. So it's always good to know before you drill. Um, the video also mentioned, you know, the North Atlantic right whale is in the Atlantic. Um, to date, there are only about 400 individuals left and less than 100 of those are breeding females. Um, so it's pretty important to protect this creature among many other animals that live in the Atlantic. And always important to consider things when you're looking for places to drill. Um, there's a group called Deep Search, which Dr. Joy is also a part of as well as one of our other researchers, Dr. Eric Cordes, um, who works for EcoGig as well as Deep Search, um, that was exploring in the Atlantic as a way to kind of inform decision-making on drilling. Um, and they came across a huge deep sea coral reef of this coral called Lophelia, um, which is the only uh, deep sea reef building coral. Um, and nobody had any idea it existed there. Um, and this was in 2018 is when they discovered this reef, which is 85 miles long, huge, huge reef. So I'll play this video for you real quick. Right, so we're always trying to learn more about what's there and it's always good to try to protect what's there before doing something like drilling for oil and the potential for disaster could happen at any time. 
Um, okay, so I just wanna talk briefly about oil spill response, how we clean it up. And then I have a little activity to share um, for those of you who are tuning in with kids at home and want something to do, or if you are a kid tuning in, um, this is something you can do at home with the supplies you have on hand. I'm gonna show you how um, I share, how I do it if I was visiting a classroom. Um, but the activity is also on our website. So I'll share more about that in a little bit. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about in general, how have we cleaned up oil spills in the past? Um, we do a lot of um, containment like booms and protective barriers, um, removal like burning, skimming, evaporating, uh, collecting it and using dispersants, which doesn't actually help remove it, but it helps break it down. Um, into smaller piece particles, uh, and then also cleaning up wildlife. And um, I'd say that oil, our oil spill response probably could be better, but uh, we're always learning more. I think every, unfortunately, every time there's an oil spill, I think we learn more about how to manage um, the oil that's been spilled. And, um, but I'll just share what we did after the and by we, I mean, not me and not EcoGig, but um, what our government did to help clean up and what first responders did to clean up. Um, and we've since learned along the way um, a little bit more about the spill and what happened and that maybe our efforts weren't as good as they could be, but we try. Um, okay, so here are some pictures. These are efforts to try and keep the oil from reaching the marsh. So um, booms trying to keep that oil that's on the surface of the water from making it onto the marsh. You can kind of see this oily slick here not working super well because there's the marsh that kind of got past the boom. Um, you can also see these ships are towing skimmers behind them to try and like scoop the oil off the surface. All of this is oil on the surface of the Gulf after the Deepwater Horizon. Um, here's another image of ships towing skimmers. Um, there's a lot of burning of the oil off the surface. Um, oil also was naturally evaporated, gets broken down when it's exposed to air and sunlight. So a lot of the pieces of the oil were able to just evaporate off, but we burned a lot of it off. Um, you can see these big clouds of smoke. Um, burning, just trying to burn a lot of the oil off. Um, unfortunately, the burning created a lot of soot particles and things that then um, sank to the bottom and took some of the oil with them as they kind of gathered, collected particles in the water. Um, sometimes the oil kind of stuck to that and took it to the bottom. Um, we also apply dispersant to the oil to try and break it up instead of it arriving on the beaches as like big tar balls. Um, they apply a dispersant to it, which is kind of like adding soap, um, except it's a chemical, but they apply it to the oil um, and it helps break it down into little droplets. So you can think of like when you put soap on cooking oil mixed with water, it helps break up the, break up the oil. Um, they applied 1.8 million gallons of dispersant. So you can see this plane is spreading dispersant. Um, they also applied dispersant directly to the wellhead. So this is an image of the Deepwater Horizon wellhead gushing oil. Um, and they actually dis um, added dispersant right there to try and break it up as it was coming out. Um, we also just manually scooped it off of the marsh, the beaches. You can see everybody's in their protective gear. It's pretty yucky stuff, raw crude oil. Um, there's more people working to clean up the oil off the beaches. Uh, more scooping it. I think a lot of it was a lot of a lot of work to get it any sort of 
oil off of, once it makes landfall, it's pretty messy work. There was a lot of oil on the beaches. Um, people also work to clean up animals. So here they're cleaning up a pelican. Um, there were turtles. This is a turtle that they are cleaning up um, or taking out of the water so that they can take it and clean it up. See here he is wiping the turtle down. Um, you know, you can see that the people are wearing protective gear. The animals obviously are not. So um, unfortunately, a lot of animals didn't make it even with cleanup efforts because they're just so coated in, in oil, which is pretty toxic when it comes directly out of a wellhead. Um, the animals that live in the Gulf of Mexico and um, you know, I showed you all the incredible life that does live near oil seeps. That's a naturally occurring seep where the, um, the bacteria have worked to break down the oil and make it less toxic. But when we're drilling for oil and tapping into an oil reserve underneath the seafloor, um, it's just a lot more toxic coming right out of the well. It hasn't had the chance to be broken down by bacteria and make it um, a less toxic version. So how, how good did we do cleaning up the oil? Um, they, this graphic is from Gulf Sea Grant. Um, it's ever changing as the research informs it, but um, they estimate, and some of our researchers have worked to help inform some of these numbers. So 20 to 25% was evaporated. Um, 12 to 13 percent naturally dispersed just through ocean water movement. Uh, 10 to 20 percent was chemically dispersed using chemicals applied to the well or to the oil. 5 to 6 percent was burned. 2 to 4 percent was skimmed. Um, 16 to 17 percent was directly recovered at the wellhead, but then there's this big missing chunk like, where did it go? Um, our researchers have actually found that that unaccounted for chunk um, is on the bottom of the Gulf. Um, a good chunk of the oil, about 50% of it almost, never made it to the surface. Um, it just kind of got stuck in a uh, about a thousand meter depth water water depth um, the, uh, because. The Gulf is not all one density of water. There's different uh, salinities, salt, saltiness, different temperatures. Um, there's just different water masses that exist in all of our oceans. Um, and in the Gulf, the oil gushing out of the wellhead, a lot, some of it just got stuck in a, in a certain depth because it just stopped moving and it just kind of formed this deep sea plume. And then that plume eventually settled out onto the seafloor. And then there was also a bunch of oil that did make it to the surface that then settled down to the seafloor as marine oil snow. So that would be like oil droplets mixed with like fecal matter from little animals like plankton um, and dead plankton. They all kind of form this like underwater blizzard. Um, and that's a very interesting topic to talk about for another webinar, but, uh, but the, marine, the marine snow kind of collected the oil and helped settle it to the seafloor. Uh, so there is quite a bit of oil still on the bottom of the Gulf. And that's where we think it is. Um, okay, so my little activity for you guys, um, if you choose to do this, this is a fun little hands-on activity. And now that you've learned about oil, in the Gulf and oil spills, you can see how good you are at cleaning up a spill. So what you're gonna need is a tray that can hold water. And I usually add like one to two inches or so of water or fill it up, you know, halfway of the tray. And then get yourself some cooking oil and a couple tablespoons of cocoa powder and mix it together. So you, there, there's your oil. Um, and then gather some stuff around your house. What can you use to clean up with? Um, Things I like to bring into the classroom, paper towels, cotton balls, cotton swabs, pantyhose, um, yarn, foil, chopsticks, or whatever you have on, on hand at home is just things that you think would be absorbent. 
Um, and then get yourself some little plastic animals or even action figures. You can also use pom-poms, feathers, leaves, sticks. All of those could be your pretend creatures. Um, and then the goal of the activity is just to contain and remove as much oil as you can and also clean up the animals. And this is a really fun, just hands-on activity. All the kids I do this with really enjoy it. Um, so these are some pictures of um, kids in the summer camp that I lead doing this activity. So they, you know, get a little oil, you pour some of your oil in there and then you try and remove it and you see that it's pretty hard to do, um, but it's fun. Uh, so you could use like the cotton balls to help soak up the oil. Um, you could use yarn as a boom. You can uh, take pantyhose and put cotton balls inside it to act like a boom. Just it's kind of a fun activity if you're looking for something to do. It's a great, great thing to keep yourself entertained for 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and this activity is uh, printable on our website. So if you want to print it out and the instructions are on there and the things that you might need to do this, uh, it's on our website, ecogig.org backslash printables and look for the oil spill challenge. Uh, this is something that we adapted from a version that was created originally by Cynthia Kudebeck. And um, so she's got a version on her website as well. Uh, we've kind of modified it a little bit, made it um, more Gulf of Mexico related, but uh, credit goes to her first, but it's a great activity. Check it out on our website if you're looking for something to do. Um, and then that's all I have for today. So if you have, um, if you'd like to tune into more webinars, please visit our website, um, ecogig.org. There's a link on the homepage um, or all past webinars are on YouTube. And with that, I'm going to um, open it up for questions. And also if Dr. Joy would like to say a few things about, about oil in the ocean or whatever she sees fit to sit, share with us. Sure. Thanks, Emily. Um, so you know, tonight at uh, 10 o'clock is, is the 10th anniversary of the blowout on the Deepwater Horizon um, drilling platform. And, you know, 11 men died and I, I it was a, it was a tragic disaster. Um, one of the sort of silver linings to come out of the disaster was the sort of stimulus of research funding uh, that resulted from the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. And it, it really just fast-tracked and, and facilitated research in the Gulf of Mexico in a way that I don't, I don't think any of us really imagined all of the discoveries that would come out of the GOMRI program. Um, but one of the things that I, I guess people don't talk about very much is the, the community of researchers that were um, the, the students and postdocs who were supported through the GOMI program and just this huge community of researchers that have been trained in oil spill science and are now going to, you know, go out and do their own work in other places, not just the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but, you know, Emily touched on a, on a few issues that I'd just like to follow up on. You know, oil and gas drilling in the Gulf has expanded significantly since 2010 and a lot of the safety uh, regulations that were put in place after Deepwater Horizon to prevent um, something similar from happening have been rolled back in the last few years. And in fact, one of the rules that made a, that was rolled back just recently, um, ostensibly, ostensibly because of the COVID um, emergency was that the reporting um, of, of spills and discharges, they, they relaxed the reporting rules. So industry doesn't have to report uh, that there are accidents right now. And, and that's obviously a big problem and something that has resulted in a substantial decrease in, in reports. So they can self-report, but they're not required to report. So of course the reporting has dropped off um, substantially. Um, but oil and gas release into the ocean is, is a natural process that occurs at these sites, at these natural seeps. Um, but industry is responsible for, for just as many discharges and really need to, to keep doing the kind of work, you know, interdisciplinary team science that we've been doing uh, for the past decade um, 
in the wake of deep water, we need to keep pushing forward with that work because it's really important to understand how this, this material moves in the natural environment and how um, naturally occurring microbial communities can sort of limit uh, damage by these inputs. So, you know, please ask questions, type them in the box and um, we're happy to answer them. Thanks, Mandy. Um, okay, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them or Mandy, throw them in the chat box. I'm gonna make sure that there's no Q and A. Um, if not, please, if you think of anything after the fact or have a question for Dr. Joy, you can email ecogigoutreach at gmail.com and um, we'll make sure to get your questions answered. And please tune in to our next webinar, which will be, will be next Wednesday, the 29th, not this Wednesday, just all the way to the 29th. I'm gonna talk about plastic pollution in the ocean. Um, so tune in there. Oh, let's see, I have a question. Uh, where around the US are we seeing oil exploration happening? Uh, I'm assuming you're meaning in US waters or in the water, not necessarily in the US, yes. Um, Mandy, do you have um, a sure. good answer So the, the majority of offshore production and exploration is in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, off California, for example, there was a lot of production you know, prior uh, to the Santa Barbara incident in, in 1969, but they, they basically made it illegal um, for, for offshore production uh, to occur there. There's a, there's a big push, as Emily said, um, to pursue production along the East Coast corridor. That has, uh, that's not something that's imminent because there has to be a lot of mapping and environmental impact assessments um, conducted before that would happen. And, and right now, if they were to open the, the East Coast corridor up tomorrow, it would still be several years, if not, you know, five or 10 before actual production or exploration could happen because, you know, there's, they, they'd have to do impact assessments for the cetaceans, they'd have to do better mapping to figure out, you know, whether this is worthwhile with respect to, you know, recoverable oil and gas out there. Um, so the East Coast is, the West Coast is really not an option. It's an active margin, it's dangerous. The East Coast is, is not on the table right now. The Gulf of Mexico is actively being ex exploited by industry for oil and gas recovery. Um, the other area in, in US territorial waters where this is, is being scored is, is, is obviously in Alaska. Um, and, and frankly, there, there's not, you know, the ar drilling in the Arctic is, is very challenging and very problematic. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine how oil spill response um, would would be effective in, in 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 the Arctic, especially if you consider that, you know, for for long periods of time, it's dark twenty four hours a day, and you know, there's ice cover and and all kinds of other you know really tough oceanographic conditions. Um, companies have tried to 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 drill and produce in the in the Arctic with with no success so far, and with a lot of problems. So, I I I think that. It, in the long term sort of scheme of things, we have to move towards renewable energy and, and a sustainable economy and a sustainable energy structure for, for the United States and for the world. And you know, the sooner we move past oil and gas and start thinking about green solutions, the better. So I, you know, that's gonna take a lot of grassroots effort. It's gonna take a lot of um, motivation and pushing from, from you know, the general public to push their politicians towards the greener side of the spectrum. Um, but in the meantime, right now, oil and gas is really cheap. Um, Netflix is, 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 is worth more money than Exxon right now in terms of companies. Um, this, the, the price war that's happening has pushed the, the cost of per barrel down to some of the lowest levels uh, historically in a, in a very long time. So, you know, maybe maybe this whole situation will sort of lead us to a more sustainable future. At least that's my hope. Thank you, Mandy. And um, Brock, who asked the question, says thank you for your time as well. You're welcome. Any other questions before I end the webinar? No? 
There uh, seem to be. Uh, okay, we're good. Yep. Nope. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and end things for today. But thank you for everybody who tuned in. And it's uh, if you want to share it, the this will live on our YouTube channel as well. So, thank you very much, and thank you, Mandy, for tuning in as well. Sure. Thank you, Emily. See ya. All right.